Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children 18 plus, you are tuned in to the Lone Officer Podcast with me, Dustin Owen, and an extremely special guest all the way from Minneapolis, Minnesota. You hear me talk about this man episode through episode, all 200 episodes. His name is Rod- Rene Rodriguez. He is the master of mindset. He is the guru of good talk. He is my friend for the past 15 years. And he has come on in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he is here for a special private event to spend time with us to talk about how we can increase our influence within our community and with our clients. But Renee, before we get started, let's talk about how you and I met each other. I want to talk about this guru of good talk. I mean, good, the guru you, of good did you talk. Stay up thinking about that one. That was good. They, you know, when <laughs> when I was getting started in the mortgage industry, and you you, you know both of my my business partners, David and Mike, but yeah. David especially, he and I went through the same exact rookie training course. And then when Mike and I partnered, they used to stand outside of my office, and they made a joke, and the joke was shit. Dio would say. <laughs> And yes, so the, the guru of good talk like would 100% it. hit that category of shit Dio would say. I like it. Sometimes I don't even know what's going to come out of this mouth, but when I get excited, anything, anything goes. So we can swear. I just noticed that. Oh, yeah. John's little beat button works really well. Okay, good. All yes. Right, good. Okay, good. Yeah, I keep it real on the show, Renee. Okay, I like it. Yeah, like there's it. nothing pretentious. So it's just going to be you and I sitting down talking shop. Good. But I do, I mean, I know we're going to get there, but ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this dude has a book dropping called Amplify Your Influence. You got to check it out. He just came from a massive event that he headlined in Las Vegas, 500 of the best mortgage professionals. In fact, Ray, I'm going to humble you a little bit, but this dude right here, he has influenced some of the top mortgage professionals in the entire industry. And right now, he was just telling me off camera how he's influenced some of the top influencers in our country, regardless of industry. And the fact that I can say that I met you 15 years ago when we both were getting started, how cool is that? I think it's awesome, man. How cool is that? So, yeah, we, what, we got the, what we, stories, we got the stories. Yeah, the I was say, what stories are we going to tell and which ones are we going to keep to ourselves? <laughs> you, keep you, in mind, my kids do listen. All right, all right, good. <laughs> I'm going to follow your lead on that one. I'll follow you. No, it's, you know, it's been fun to watch. You all had, and you always had the big, big vision you always had big vision. I think you always looked at what you wanted to do. You always had a big ability to think big. And that's one of the things I always loved about you. And one of the reasons I always gravitated towards you is, and I think watching that big vision turn into skill, watching the skill turn into talent, turn into results, and watching you guys continually grow has been just fun to watch, man. So just from, as a friend, congratulations on watching what you guys are doing. Thank you. Watching you take this podcast and, and what you've done with it. It's, it's an honor to be here. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And we are in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, because Renee is here. His event is called Amplify. You all can and should look into when you can afford it, finding a way to attend and Amplify, because it is an event unlike any other. But that's how a Orlando kid and a Minneapolis kid were able to get together <laughs> on a Wednesday night is because I made arrangements for Renee and I to get together in this hotel room. But shout out, what hotel were you in? La Meridian? La Meridian. La Meridian. Shout out yeah. to the La, La, La Meridian. La Meridian. La Meridian. Le, 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 I think um, so. But no, so let's let's go back a little bit because we were just talking about this off camera. And I think the, the, the T-Loppers who are hardcore, who tune in religiously on Spotify and Apple and on YouTube, and they, they follow what we do, will appreciate 15 years ago, you and I were two kids in our mid to late 20s. Mm-hmm. We had some experience. We had some success. We had fallen down and scraped ourselves really hard in 2006 and 2007. Mm -hmm. And you were hired by, at the time, Waterstones president and CEO to basically MC our first ever manager meeting. And that meeting probably only had 20 people in there. 80. It was 80 people? 80. Because uh, I remember you all staring at me at that second day. Yeah, no, well, oh, that, 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 that second day. But you you were brought in, and, and one of my favorite memories is you taught me, a young leader for the first time, is it 40 for 30, right? 40 volts, 30 seconds. 40 volts, 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. And what, what's the premise of that again? <laughs> so my background, for those who don't know, is behavioral neuroscience. That's, and so 
that course that we did is now called Engage. Okay. So Amplify was built up on the science of that course. And that course has been since probably for the last 30 years, 100,000 people have gone through that course. And originally built on taking very hostile work environments, people that were working together under massive stress and teaching them how to communicate better. And so we look at the science behind communication, the science behind how we structure our language, but more importantly, why we resist new ideas. And so learning that there's a sequence of how I say things. In building that process, it's sort of a day to two day process. Now we do it in a day, you guys got the full two days. There's a method and things that we do to sort of build that. And one of them is understanding that, you know, our brain, if we move our hand like this, you know, making a fist and opening it up or moving a finger, it's sent from a decision that we make in our brain that sends electrical chemical signals through our brain. So you can actually measure how many volts are in our brain. And what they found is that we have approximately 40 volts of electricity. And in that 40 volts, if you know anything about Ohm's law, you know, voltage isn't actual energy, it's potential energy. It's, you know, amps would be the actual released energy. So what's potential? It's like taking a rubber band and pulling it back and not letting it go. There's the voltage. It's okay. ready, right? And so we have this potential energy. And so the question always is, is, okay, so we've got 40 volts. What are we paying attention to? That's where we release it. And so the example we always gave was, you know, you walk into a room and someone's on their computer and they're doing email. You say, hey, you got a minute? And they go, sure. And they're, they're typing away, click, 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 click. And they go, yeah, I'm just going to finish my email, but I'm listening to you. And you already know they're not listening. And so that feeling of their 40 volts are being split between you and them. And, you know, people think they multitask, but they really don't. They're rapidly refocusing between you, them, and all of us. If we're really honest, we're saying, I'm going to do both, but I'm just going to do what I'm doing. I'm going to stop what I'm doing for a second, pick up a few words in case I'm tested, go back to what I'm doing, <laughs> pick up a few words, listen, I'm tested. So, and they go, were you listening? Yeah, you just said this. Yeah, see, I'm listening. And then you go back. And so we know that we don't feel listened to. And so then the other 30, the number 30 comes from a study on doctors and bedside manners. Well, they watched patients and doctors for two weeks, and they said they would watch their interactions, and they would uh, have the patients rate the doctors on bedside manners afterwards. And they found that the doctors that were rated highest for bedside manners had one distinguishing factor, and that was that they had thirty. They spent 30 seconds of focused attention with their patients. And it wasn't 30 minutes. It was just literally 30 seconds. And so we always said, what if you combine 40 volts of focus, all your energy, for 30 seconds? And somebody comes in, hey, you got 40 for 30. You stop what you're doing. You look at them. What could be accomplished? And so it becomes a sort of this code between organizations of saying, you know, hey, you know, everyone 40 for 30. You know, I need your 40 volts. It's a way of saying, let's not multitask for a minute. And what's really cool is that you can solve most and answer most questions within a 30-second period of focused attention. So that's where 40 for 30 comes from. Well, I need to thank you for that because when I first met you, I was a young branch manager. Right at the time, like most young branch managers in the mortgage industry, I was a top producer mm -hmm. who didn't know a lick about leadership and about management. Right, I had to learn that the hard way over trials and tribulations. But your 40 for 30, and, I, and I'm in a partnership, right? And we talked about my two business partners, and we used that. And sometimes we would use it in jest or with like a wink and a smile, but it still worked. Underline truth. We could walk in, I could walk into Smalley's office and say, Smalley, and he'd be looking down. I said, Mike, he'd be looking down and say, hey, 40 for 30. And he go, <laughs> okay, but guess what? He'd give it to me. He'd give it to you. And it worked. And still today, going on 15 years later, we still use it. Mm -hmm. And that was powerful, right? That was almost as powerful as the shot to Eric was buying us that night. <laughs> <laughs> that made the next day a little bit difficult, but hey, yeah. you live and you learn. Let me ask you this. How did you, did you go, did you grow up knowing this is what you wanted to do? Like, did you go to college? And, and this is like, you're like, yes, I want to be a mindset guy. I want to teach people how to influence, how to how to give great public speeches, how to tell stories, how to do tie downs and takeaways. What was your background like leading into what your career is now? Which I do want to say this, homeboy, you're at the top of your game. You've been at this for 20, 25 years, right? 27. 27 years. And I want people to tune in and listen to that for the young entrepreneurs. 27 years. I'm going to tell you, his star has never been brighter, mm -hmm. right? It has never been brighter. And as your friend, it is so cool to watch. Thanks, man. Right? Sometimes I'm envious. <laughs> no lie. I'll trade like, you in. I'll trade you paychecks. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Maybe. <laughs> See, he, knows. he knows what's up. <laughs> but, but, but nonetheless, no, it, I do want to say, if we've, on, on camera, in front of everyone to hear, and I want to have a record of it, congratulations. No, I appreciate it that. truly Awesome to see. Thank you. And for, for those younger entrepreneurs tuning in, it's 27 years in the making. 
right? So overnight success, twenty-seven it, years overnight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Overnight, <laughs> over many nights, whatever the third three hundred sixty-five times twenty-seven is yeah. that many, that many nights with with plenty of failures and plenty of missed opportunities, yeah. plenty of successes along the way. Absolutely, right? But no, but how did you how did you get started? You know what's interesting, and in, in what I what I and I'm glad you said that to people. And first, thank you very much for saying that. But it is, it's it. Nothing is overnight, and nor should it be. And does it mean that? And you say, okay, 27 years, I don't feel like I've reached anything. You know, the feeling is I'm just, I'm like, okay, I'm just getting started, right? Yeah. And I think that's going to feel that way till the day I die. And, I, and I'm, I'm kind of glad about that because, and the reason I feel that way is because I love the process. I was talking to this, the same conversation with my kids and I was like, do you remember, because they were saying, dad, look at what's going on. I see you here and I see you there. We got the book, we got this and I see this and I see this person talking about you. We got, And I'm like... I go, do you remember how many times people try to hire me? They go, if you were just to go sell this product, you would make this much money when we weren't making money? Mm -hmm. And they go, yeah. I said, do you remember why I said no? I said, because I didn't love it. I said, yeah, we ate shit for a while, for a long time. I go, but I loved every moment of it. And I go, now I get to do what I love and make the money. Yeah. It just took a long time. Yeah. Right? And that, I think, is such an, uh, you have to fall in love with the process and, and when you fall, you got to love that you fall doing what you love. And it's not even a fall. You're like, okay, that doesn't work. How do I fix? Because you're still learning. And so you, it almost doesn't feel like a fall, even though you're like, okay, I messed that one up. But you know why you messed it up. I made this poor decision. Okay, well, I'm not going to do that again. And you get up, dust off, and whatever. And then you fall enough times, you realize no one can really take anything away from you because you, the worst place you're going to be is in a place you've been so many times <laughs> and you've gotten out of so many times. And it's like... Like, who cares? Take my money. So what? Take it. Like, it doesn't matter. We'll do something else to get it back. But you can't take my, you can't take what I love. You can't take my integrity. You can't take the things that I truly believe. And those are the things that you hold on to. So how did I get into it? Answer your question. You know, I, my mother was the most influential person in my life. And, you know, former nun, thank God she wasn't anymore and for my sake. And sort of the, the, the thing that I always stay with. But her journey through life um, as somebody who wanted, you know, was a nun who wanted global peace and community was her vision. And after eight years in the convent, leaving and realizing that wasn't where she was going to do it, working with migrant labor and sort of this whole journey through how is she going to impact the world? She had a lot of lessons along the way. I mean, she got a chance to watch a culturally Catholic country turn communist in eight months, in six months, Cuba. Oh, wow. Right? Yeah. Before and after the Cuban yeah. Revolution. I mean, culturally Catholic to become communist, six months. How they did that. It wasn't through logic. It was walking, watching people walk the fields. The soldiers walked the fields, educated. There was a grassroots effort. They took over the education system. There was, it, there was fascinating ways that they did it. She watched, landed in Germany after the Holocaust. The promise of war and the reality of war, the destruction, the level buildings, and watching the change that caused bodies. And so she always said, how do you create change that was good without killing people, right? And, you know, in Cuba, it was like the, the promise of revolution was, you know, it's okay if people died for the revolution. But then she's like, okay, but then once they got into power, then they'll be good? No, they got into power and they just kept practicing what they learned along the way, which was if you killed your way into power, you're going to kill when you're in power. So you have to practice peace along the way if you want peace when you're in power. If you want to love, if you want to be kind, then you have to be kind in the process. So the road to heaven needs to be heaven and so there's no difference between the the means and the end and so all these lessons. so this is your childhood growing up raised by this mother with the, these experiences this is my, yeah this yeah. is my mom right and but then watching her go through it and all of these i mean i can go on and on of these lessons and i remember at, at 17 i get or 18 i get cut from the basketball team but i remember at 17 years old i was deciding what school to go to and the i was literally walking through my mom says I'm going to do a talk at the University of St. Thomas at this creativity and business uh, workshop I'm like you're going to speak I'm like oh god that's embarrassing <laughs> and I go up there and the first the one who speaks but this guy the guy goes up his name is Bill Shepard and he goes up there and man this guy was funny he was hilarious he was he was talking about creativity it was like intriguing he used like psychology and and he was I mean I'm like this guy was a charismatic and I'm like I'm like watching this guy and, I'm and like, you're a senior in high school yeah. Okay. And I'm going, and I go, I'm like, Mom, that's that's what I want to do someday. Like, what he's doing. I want to make people feel how he's doing. And she looks at me, and she goes, really? I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, I'm next. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> do not follow this guy. Yeah. Right? How embarrassing. We go on a break. I come back. She starts. I'm 30 seconds late coming in, and she's 
playing her guitar. She's 500 business executives in downtown Minneapolis. And I'm going, oh my God, she's singing her song. And then I notice that everyone's singing along with her. They're all standing, but they're all engaged. She puts her guitar down and she starts talking. And she owns that room. You ever seen somebody move in those old Chinese movies, old Japanese, you know, those kung fu movies where they move their hands and it's like a wave? Mm-hmm. Kind of, it almost looked like she was doing that. That's how I saw her. And I'm like watching this and blown away the intelligence and the depth and all the things, the things that she had, the wisdom. And I'm like, and I start crying, dude. I'm like, this is my mom? And you're a teenager. I teenager? have teenagers. You have teenagers. Yeah. Yeah. But they, they don't you, do you that. Just, you just don't know that, like, this is the person that, like, this is my mom. I'm like, I had no idea, right? And I'm like, well, shit, I guess I got to follow her, right? And I was like watching this. I'm like, okay, so, you know, I, I go to school, you know, for behavioral neuroscience. This is what I went to school for. Okay. And she's like, learn how the brain works because that's the one thing we all have in common, right? No matter what color skin you are, it doesn't matter where you're from. And so I went to school for that. And I, I thought that I was going to play basketball for the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing, man? <laughs> I don't that, know. Maybe you have that, handles. Maybe you have handles. No, I was, you're I was, I was a good shooter. T- I was a good shooter. You're you're like me. We're tall for average people. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're like a good small point guard at six three. Yes. And I'm only two hundred and seventy pounds to be an odd NBA basketball player. But um, no, that's that's what I thought. But I get cut in my uh, sophomore year in college, and I'm like devastated. Right. One, I'm like the team didn't think I should have gotten cut. I shouldn't have gotten cut. And but anyways, I get cut and. I was talking to one of her clients at the time, and he's like, hey, how's basketball? I'm like, no, I got, I got cut. It's over. I'll go, but you know what? I got, I got a question for you. He's the CEO of a $25 billion company at the time. And he goes, what is it? I'm like, what's, I go, I have more energy and discipline. I don't know what to do with it. And I got nowhere to put it. I hate school. What's the one thing I got to learn now to be in your shoes? And he looks at me, and he smiles. He goes, and he goes, all right. He goes, you learn how to sell. If you learn how to sell, you'll always be employed. I concur with that guy. Right? Yeah. Great advice. And, and I was like 18. I'm like, okay, that's guess one. That's like, just became just like, I'm supposed to sell. Don't even know what that means at 18. I get this thing in the mail that says, you've been, you've been selected because of your GPA to join this fast-paced sales and marketing company. I'm like, well, my GPA is like a 2.3, but. <laughs> that, that's why they selected you. <laughs> probably, right? <laughs> but then, you know, it's just some mass recruiting. So I go to, yeah. I basically was recruited to, to sell cookware door to door. Oh, well, Cutco. Uh, well, C- Cutco made our knives. It was Salad Master. Okay. And, and Royal Prestige was the first one. By the way, as a hiring manager in the sales industry, mm-hmm. I love, or a sales industry, I'm in the mortgage industry, but it's, it's sales, sales it's financial it's, sales. It totally is. I love someone who called, who sold Cutco. The best. Successfully. Yes. Successfully. Because we all, we all have a friend who tried <laughs> to sell Cutco because they were in our parents' living room yeah. cutting open a, a, a Pepsi can. Yep. But if you sold Cutco, like we had this this uh, younger professional on, who's like one of um, one of her company's t- rising stars, top producer. Yeah. And when I interviewed her, it didn't surprise me when she's like, "Oh yeah, I made thirty grand in college one summer mm-hmm. selling Cutco." So you you did something similar. Oh, I was making, that makes perfect sense. I was I was making five thousand dollars a night selling cookware. 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 Okay, so cook, so not Cutco, well, but cookware similar. Well, so co- the cookware was, so Zig Ziglar sold cookware for 17 years for Salad Master. Okay. Right. So I was trained by some of the guys that trained Zig. No way. Yeah. The same storytellers and the same everything. Okay. Like, you know, this is all, oh, it's, 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 it's full circle now. Oh, it makes, makes sense, it makes perfect right? sense. Okay. And so, you know, here I am, I'm, I'm, I'm a hardcore sales guy. At 18 years old, I become number five in the United States, Canada, Mexico. And I'm going to this million dollar party. I'm like 18. I'm in New York City. I'm a head outside of a limo. I'm like, I'm, I'm like, so basketball cuts me. I learned to sell. I put the same discipline in selling. And I'm like, and I'm here. So I'm in this for life. Yeah. For life, man. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. And then you, then, so let's talk about that. What is sales? Sales is about persuasion. Sales is about presentation. Sales is about understanding who you are. Sales is about passion. Sales is about believing in something. It's about influence. It's about learning psychology. I mean, there's so many beautiful things to be a sales pro that you have to learn self coping methods how to deal with rejection who you I, there's so i mean i can go on and on about all of the skill sets and the traits and the, the things that you have to really embody and i just became a student of that and i just became i just, just so for 5 years i did that for 4 years excuse me in college so here i'm hardcore sales guy door to door $5000 for the for the 2500 a small set 5000 a large set cookware 
I went to school for behavioral neuroscience, then I get hired by a change management consulting firm that uses brain research to deal with massive scale culture change. So you put all those three together for years. What they hire you to do, the, the brain research company? To be their sales coordinator. Basically. Okay. So yeah. yeah. So I basically followed, it was my mom, mom's company. Okay. So I followed them around for five years, writing down every single thing they said, how they said it. But we worked alongside people from Harvard, from the Gallup organization, from some of the best in the world. And I got a chance to be surrounded by some of the CEOs and some of the biggest organizations and people that are running billion dollar organizations, just being in the room and learning from that. And then when you get invited into the mortgage industry. I was, how? So who, 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 because I'll tell you exactly what, what so, you teach or like off camera for those that, that weren't a part of our conversation prior to, to JC turning on the lights and uh, the cameras. Like I was asking you, like, what's next for you? When are you going to get with the people at Merrill Lynch or Northwestern Mutual? When are you, I mean, because what you teach is universal. Yeah. Well, a lot of my clients are outside the mortgage but, industry. But yes, but a lot of your clients and the people that you've influenced are big names that you see on in the social, mortgage industry that you see on social. Okay. This yeah. Is, they've taken over my social. Okay. But you're talking about a CEO of another company. They don't even have an Instagram. True. So it's like they're they incognito yeah, on purpose. I did, I did five events in Australia for environmental health and safety. That's none of that's on social. Oh, right. how cool. Yeah. So yeah. Three, okay. So, I mean, there's Cargill. I do, I do eight different amplifiers for them and work with people in Singapore and China and everything. And we're, they're all part of their cargo uh, strategy and development team. So Dude, I can't wait for dinner tonight. Yeah. I can't wait to learn more about this. Yeah, so yeah. there's you know, there's 400 different other clients outside of the mortgage industry. But you were yeah. at one time early on in your career, you were invited into the mortgage industry. So the, here's how that worked. So we had, I had just taken over the business as a as CEO in 2000, it's August 2001. This is the company your mom was yeah. a was a founding member of. Mm -hmm. That you was a, you were a sales director. Yep. And now you have That's elevated right. yourself to run the company. To run the company. Okay. We're doing fifty five workshops at twenty three or twenty four years of age. Uh, well, Ish. I'm not going to date. Maybe you. a little older. Maybe a okay. little older. And so now I'm CEO. It's August. We're doing fifty five workshops a month, and I've got thirty seven consultants, twenty five employees. I'm like, I'm killing it, right? Fifty five workshops a month. I mean, all over the country, simultaneous. We had this thing rolling and 9-11 happens. Mm. And I'm driving, I'm going, wow, this is crazy. Like I just like, and I have zero even inclination that this has any impact on my business. And I'm just, I mean, I'm blown away. I'm sad. I'm kind of shocked. And I go into the office and we're watching it on the TV and wow, well, we just got to get back to work. You know, I had consultants that were trapped in Pennsylvania. You know, so we're trying to figure out how to get them home. You know, typical stuff. Yep. And a week later, we had we were in the process of figuring out how are we going to build cash for the next eight months because we had this big contract, million-dollar contract that was starting, and then we, we had to start building business beyond that. Well, that client called. I remember Martha Williamson, never forget. She was the sweetest lady. She ran. She was an executive assistant for the plant manager at Regalwood. She said, Renee, I'm like, hey, Martha. She goes, it breaks my heart to tell you this, but we need to, the next week we were starting, she goes, we are canceling indefinitely our contract at the Regal Wood Mill. Oil prices have gone up too high, and we need to cut costs, and we will not be doing the training. I'm sorry, and um, I just need to communicate that to you right now. I need to get back to other matters. And I was like, Martha, I completely understand. Not a problem. And I hung up, and I go, oh, shit. We have no more cash. Ooh. At all. And I've got 25 employees and I've got everything. And so I'm like, okay, so what do we do? I had a mentor at the time that used to work for Jack Welsh at, uh, okay. at, at, at GE. I called him up and he goes, you remember that red alert plan that everybody hated that I made you create? Which was, I, he, he made me create this thing called the red alert plan. And, and, he, and he, I'm like, what do you mean red alert? He goes, what if you lost all your clients? What's the minimum you need to run your business? I'm like, oh, I need everybody. He goes, no, you don't understand. What's the minimum you need? And it was like four, four of the 25. We could still operate. And he forced me to make this plan. And it was like, I didn't want to do it. And even my board was upset that I even thought that way. And when that happened, I went and pulled Red Alert off the shelf. And I'm like, I knew exactly who to fire. I knew exactly when. But these were friends. These were people that had been around forever. And 20 people in one day I had to let go. Oh. And so now I'm looking at this. We're upside down at a borrowing base with a with Wells Fargo, 400 grand, getting sued by somebody for like 300 grand, 
I'm like, I'm an awesome CEO. This is great. <laughs> right? And like from hero to zero, yeah. less than zero, hero to negative 700 grand. And I'm looking at this and going, okay. And, and uh, I, was, I was literally planning to go get my MBA at the University of Chicago. And I talked to my mentor. He goes, you turn this around, there's your MBA. I'm like, oh, man. I'm like, okay. So I got no money coming in. And I'm like, and that voice comes back and goes, learn how to sell. You'll always be employed. So I call my friend Greg Bertagnoli. He's one of the first core coaches, by the way. No way. Yeah. Okay, shout out to the core. Yeah. And uh, I call him up. I'm like, hey. And Greg was in Minneapolis yeah. with you? Okay. He's one of my best friends. Yep. I said, hey, dude, you just made a killing last year. How does this mortgage thing work? He goes, I'm waiting for you to ask me that question, bro. He goes, get your ass in here. I'm like, all right, I can show up. And I'm like, I'm like show me your sales order. I go, I think I might need to sell this, you know, for a little bit until I kind of yeah. fix this other business. Yeah. You got and bills to pay. You got bills to pay. Yeah. And I go, show, show me how this, uh, show me your sales order. He goes, what do you mean sales order? I go, what, what do you have, pe- how do you people buy? He goes, oh, he shows me, th- I'm like, dude, I don't want to, I don't want anything about a thousand and three pages. Yeah. He goes, no, 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 it's a 1003. I'm like, oh, well, whatever. And I, I give him a highlighter. I go, highlight what you need filled out. And he goes, why? I go, just highlight what you need. And I take a sheet protector. I had brought my plastic sheet protectors. And I put it in there. I go, give me a pile of those things. And I go, I'll be back. He goes, what are you going to do? I go, I'll be back. You just need the yellow, right? So, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, 1003 today is an Erla. <laughs> and, and he's talking about a handwritten loan application. Yep. Old school. Old school. I love it. 2001, here we come. No training, no certification, no licensing. No, no Xenix for you. No Xenix. <laughs> no nothing. This was a highlighter. And that's it. So I went to, I came back the next day with nine filled out. And he goes, what the hell did you do? I'm like, I said, he goes, did, what script? I go, script. I go, I just said, hey, if I can save you money on your mortgage, do you want it? And I go, I, go, I don't know what I'm doing, but I got this great team that does. Yeah. And they go, sure. I go, fill out the highlighted part. <laughs> and so I go, so what's next? <laughs> right? And he goes, well, let's choose your interest rate. I'm like, what do you mean choose your interest rate? He goes, let's pick your rate. I'm like, you can choose the interest rate? Yeah, back then you could. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, back then you could. Up until 2010, yeah. that was allowed. I'm like, oh my god. I'm like, I thought Bankrate.com chose that, right? That's yeah. how stupid I was. And he's like, yeah. So he goes, he goes, walks me over to the fax machine. He pulls one of those long, you remember these things, big letters or legal size thing with a million numbers on it. And I'm like, yeah, it's called a rate that? sheet. Or yep, rate it's sheet. it's not optimal blue anymore. Okay, or back then it's a rate sheet. And he goes, well, let's let's choose a first loan. Nine hundred seventy-eight thousand dollar house, like good friend of mine. By the way, this is two thousand and one, mm-hmm. not two thousand and twenty-one. Two thousand two, probably. Or two thousand and two, right two thousand and two yep. but nonetheless, not two thousand twenty-two. Yeah. Where that buy do like a two-bedroom, one bath in, in yeah, in California. Yeah. No, yeah. No. no, this is a mansion. Yeah, it's a big yep. house in, in Minnesota. It's, it's, it's a very nice house in yep. Minnesota. And so he goes, let's price this one. He goes, let's price it at two point seven five on the back. I'm like, the back, the back of what? And he go, I go, 2.75%. I go, you promised me an 80% commission, you liar. And I got, I just laid into him. He goes, no, dude, dude relax. Yeah. I'm like, no, see, you, I knew I couldn't trust you. Yeah. And, I, and I was going, he goes, Renee, just pull out your calculator. I'm like, pull out my calculator. By the way, that was a hell of a split. Like, that was a, that was a friend and family split. Oh, it totally was. Yeah, well, okay. he knew, like, yeah. he knew what he yeah. was getting into. Yeah. And so he go, I pull it out. He goes, $978,000. And he goes, he goes we're going to pay 2.75% on the back, yield spread premium. <laughs> And we're going to give you a 1% origination fee. That's 3.75. I'm like, okay, 3.75 times what? He goes, 97. Okay, yeah. He goes, 80% of that number. I'm like. I'm For like, all those math majors going home, it's a $30,000 commission check on one loan. Even, I think it was like almost forty. Was it? Yeah. yeah like 30, I'm to, if, 30, if a million dollars at 3.75 would be 37,500. 80% of that. There you go. 80% of that gets me somewhere oh, around you're, No, you're right. No, you, yeah, I, yeah, I was I'm, looking at 37,000. Yeah, you're yeah. right. You did the 80%. You, yeah, you see, yeah, that's yeah. why I'm not the mortgage guy. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, and by the way, I teach this shit. Yeah, like tloponline.com. That's T L O P online.com. I do not teach yeah, this I shit. I teach this shit. And I tell people, like, look, it's fourth grade math. Mrs. Stout, actually, she's my third grade teacher. So now it's third grade math because I'm going to shout out Mrs. Stout if she's still around. But Mrs. Stout taught me my, uh, my multiplication tables, right? That's awesome. A lot of what we do is just simple, quick, basic yeah. math. So many grown ass adults, though, struggle with that. Totally. All right. So I, I did so, that, and I'm like, I looked, I go, that, you're going to pay me that amount of money for filling out this shit? He goes, welcome to the mortgage industry. Yeah. And so I looked at that, and I was blown away. So I went, and I knew that I was going to be a disaster. So I went and bought Allison and Lindsay, and I said, I bought, went to MarthaStewart.com, and I bought them this huge bouquet of flowers. I said, they go, what's this for? I go, this is preemptive for the, the headaches <laughs> that I'm going to cause you, because I'm going to fill these things out, and I don't know what to do, and I'm just going to hand them over to you. Yeah. 
and I go, whatever you need, just let me know. They're like, oh my God, they're so nice, right? And I was like, I knew that I was just, this is, I knew they were, un, yeah. they were unappreciated and everything. So that was my thing. And after about a month of that, I'm like, you know, I hate this. And I looked at my friend, I go, you got 65 loan officers and none of them know how to sell. Let's teach them how to sell. And he goes, let's do it. So I cre created 27 courses, I mean the short version, for that year. Did one every other week. First time four people showed up. And it took me two weeks to create that course for two hours. And four people showed up. Those four people said, this is the best thing I've ever done. Can I bring, uh, can we do it again next week? I'm like, yeah. 15 people showed up. They go, can I bring my realtors to this? We looked at each other. 2002, like, I'm like, yeah. yeah. So then we started doing it every other week. One was internal loan officers, then one was a realtor event. And all we did was create that. And we just did that. For, and after six months, we had 110 people standing room only every single were, month. Were you charging for this at this point or Free. still doing it pro bono? Free. For Greg. <coughs> well, now I'm a partner in yes. the company. So yeah. he, he's, I'm now 20% owner of a mortgage company, but I'm bringing 110 realtors a month through his doors. Yeah. Right? And, solid. And That's doing a, solid. Week, a weekly presentation uh, for 45 minutes over lunch every week on Wednesdays and created this. And what I was trying to do was teach loan officers to have a milestone. You don't know a sales process, but you have one now. Every Wednesday, bring one to two realtors. I'm doing the presentation. You don't know how to present. I do. Do that. And then every month, we're going to build all those people. We're going to bring them to the final event. And we're going to do that every month. We blew out the wall. We, we built the Minnesota Education Center, Training Center, and this guy in the back. Eric Mitchell. Oh, yeah. He goes, you saved my life. I did this thing on procrastination. He signs his contract. He just had a heart attack, loses 25 pounds, brings me out to meet Tim Brahim. Okay. Right. So then I meet And Tim that was Loan Toolbox. Loan Toolbox. At the okay. Time. I meet Tim Brahim. We go through. I give him some feedback on a presentation. Tim and I become really good friends. And I did a training, the same thing I did for you guys, for all Loan Toolbox. He goes, like, this is great. He says, you're going to help design business plan 2008. Okay. So I, so I planned, he planned days one and two. I planned days th three and four. That was a huge success. And so that was sort of my... And, and by the way, for those that don't know, because they're newer to the industry or they're thinking about getting into the industry, Business Plan 2008 is your normal sales conference. Uh, it's a three, four day event. Um, I think Stephen Marshall does one now. Todd Duncan does one now. Mm -hmm. you, your, your event, AmpCon, that was two weeks ago, mm -hmm. you were the front end of an event that's probably similar to what that was, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. That's so cool. Like, it's it's cool to hear, like, none of us, very, not none of us, because the Nunziata brothers and probably the, the Manglardi brothers, no, even them, the Manglardi brothers, I don't know if you know John Manglardi hmm. uh, Sr., John Manglardi Jr., uh, nonetheless, they're big name in the mortgage industry, yeah. uh, out of Chicago originally, but now yeah. one of the boys is still in Chicago, one's down my way, they're great mortgage professionals, but their dad's a mentor of mine. Cool. So when I was at American Home Mortgage back in 2007, 2008, he was my boss's boss's boss. Mm -hmm. But somehow he and I hit it off. I was the young guy, reminded him of his sons. He was someone that reminded me of my father, but he knew mortgages. My father knew his electrical work very well. Um, and throughout the years, he and I have, have stayed in contact. But um, even his sons, my point being, they didn't even think that they're going to be in the mortgage business, right? Mm -hmm. Like none of us grow up yeah. saying we want to be in or we want to support yeah. the mortgage business. I mean, you didn't grow up thinking, hey, I want to I wanna encourage others yeah. and teach others how to sell, how to be better influencers, how to be better storytellers. It's so cool hearing your story because we all have one. Yeah. And for anyone who's tuned in this far, and if you feel like you haven't found your place yet, it's okay. Just know that you're on the journey. You're currently on the journey. Your story is being is being created one page at a time. Absolutely. Just like, just like ours was. I was sharing with, with Renee off camera. This podcast, we are scratching the surface of where we think we can go. Yeah. Like we're getting 80, almost 90,000 downloads a month. It's what started incredible. as a passion project. Mm -hmm. It was our way of giving back. It was our way of doing something for our loan officers and our clients. We're now realizing, wait a minute, we need to amplify our influence. Yeah. Because we had this opportunity. It wasn't what we set out to do two years ago. But now that it's in front of us, probably like, like you and training mortgage loan originators, you didn't set out to do that, no. but as circumstances unfolded, that was the direction that your path took, and then you look for opportunities to lean into your strengths and more importantly, your passions. Yeah. So l let's let's like unpack that. What is Rene Rodriguez passionate about? Here we are in 2022. <clears throat> what makes you tick? What gets you excited to get out of bed besides your new fiance? <laughs> besides her? Yeah, that's, a, that's an easy one. Yeah. So no, I think, the, 
you know, the work, what it's all culminated to now is an undying and unshakable belief that we all have a story. And, but my, the journey of being able to, when you're talking about 27 years ago, talking about human emotion, talking about communication, and this is actually a great transition to this because this is what's most important to me right now. I had a good mentor. Good one. Back then, people don't understand how hard it was to talk about, I mean, you, human emotion, communication, that I feel something, um, there wasn't, emotional intelligence wasn't even around back then. 30 years ago, it just wasn't even a concept. And me learning into that, having to learn how to put a business language to what they call the soft skills back then, for 27 years, to now being able to know what the business case is, to saying your story, but hold on a second. Let me show you how to monetize that business story. Let me show you how that works in business. Let me show you how that translates into your value proposition. That marriage of those two to show people that it isn't one or the other. Your mission can also be, your personal mission can also be the business mission. And when you merge those two, the purpose that comes from that is awesome. And so here's the thing. If you want to talk about what's like like right on my mind, it's this concept called the, uh, the narrative gap. Okay. And so let's go back 30 years ago. Most people died very close to where they worked. They just did. That's just what it was. And if I worked for you, I knew I spent most of the days with you. Mm -hmm. We were in the same room, the same office. I saw you. If you got mad at me, I knew what your facial expressions looked like. And after work, if I got a haircut, when we needed haircuts, <laughs> we probably went to the same barber. Grocery store, probably went to the same grocery store. And if we were baseball games, you probably coached my kids. Mm -hmm. And church, probably saw you there too, right? And so there was this constant interaction. You saw me at 4 o'clock mass because I don't do Sunday mornings. <laughs> got it. 4 o'clock mass. Got it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Saturday. I was, I was at Saturday you mass. You were Saturday mass. Okay. But there was this constant interaction. And so I knew who you were. So what does the word I know you means? I know your facial expressions. I know your mannerisms. I know your, your quirks. And I know what they all mean. And so there was no gap in understanding. And so what happens is, is that humans don't do well with gaps, right? So if I were like that right there, right? Almost people made, did he forget what he was going to say? No, but as a salesperson, you, 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 do you know what you just did to me? Created. The amount of anxiety I just felt with that much silence going on? Yes, Holy I know. cow, that was deadly. Yes, and so I'm going to talk about the science. That's called norepinephrine that you just felt. And so, okay. So that's half the equation for attention. The other half is dopamine. So tension is norepinephrine, but you also need uh, uh, you need uh, novelty, which I'll talk about. We're going, to, we're going to set that off for just a minute, so stay tuned on this because this all kind of flows together. But that gap that you felt, you felt tension and anxiety because you don't. your brain needs to fill it. It doesn't understand that narrative, that, that, that gap. And the narrative is about the story around it. Your anxiety was, what's happening? What's going on? I don't have a narrative. So your brain is searching for an explanation, a narrative. And so what is a narrative? A narrative is like a frame. A frame is a construct of reality. Your narrative helps you understand what reality is. Like, what's this? Okay, it's a hat. Okay, why? Because I've worn, worn hats before. What's the purpose of that? Okay, because, and I take things from the past to construct all these things in front of me. I understand life based on the narrative that happens. And so when we look at that, say, okay, 30 years ago, there was no narrative gap in leadership and management. I just knew it. Now technology comes into play. Improvements in technology, digital communications, transportation, everything. And now we're able to affect regions and we move further and further apart. Do you only deal in your, your local area or do you have branches a little bit further apart? I have branches all throughout six hours away. I have a branch 14 hours away. Right. Yeah. So now, and technology allows you to manage that. You have CRMs, communication tools, accountability tools, you have phone, video, you have all these things that allow you to manage. And the scary part is, is that it makes us think that we know each other when we actually don't. And so this is a conversation. So we partnered recently with, a, with a, a group called Chimba and Dr. Al Ringlip, who's a co-founder of the Neuro Leadership Institute. And he's got a business school in Italy that is, is world renowned, one of the best business schools, MBA programs in all of Europe. He saw what we were doing with Amplify and we talked and he's got this amazing program called Life. And his, his brain research, his neuroscience research is amazing. He saw what we we're doing. He goes, Renee, we've been studying it 30 years. You've been doing this and applying it for 27 let's merge this and yeah. talk because we want to know what you've learned, right? He goes, you're like, you're the, you're the person that's doing it. And what he's, what he said, he goes, Renee, you're the only one, the only one. And this is what he wrote. He wrote the forward to our book that understands the application of, 
of influence in its actual application. So I want to get to that. So we, we've had this conversation. We just nerd out and talking about, so what's happened through technology, we've created this huge narrative gap where people think they know each other, but they don't. And so now the scary part is what happens when I don't provide the narrative or I don't provide a frame for somebody when we're talking? For that, that little gap in time where people thought, well, something wrong with my computer? Is that, you know, if they were driving, they were listening to that. Did something happen? Did I lose the signal? They have to fill it. And that's called, that's where they have to fill the narrative gap. And I can't control what other people do. And so the risk in the narrative gap is where the problem is. Because what they fill it with is usually based on their experiences, maybe insecurities, their fears, all things I can't control. So what does that mean to leaders right now? It's the leader narrative gap that needs to be filled because leaders are expanding their reach, thinking they know people. But I have people, even at Amcom, I've had thousands of people. I said, how many of you see your manager uh, one time a month? And I get like four hands go up. The regionals typically. Uh, six times a month, a few more hands, three times, or no, uh, six times a year. A few more hands, three times a year, a few more, once a year. That's the average. Wow. And so you look at how few and how little people are seeing each other. And so now think of the mortgage industry. When I don't see you, there's this huge gap between the relationship. So I have to fill that in. And I'm going to fill that in probably based on my last interaction with you and maybe average it going forward. And maybe my previous manager's history will kind of come in to pepper that a little bit. Maybe if I have positive history, I'll probably assume the best of you. But I don't really know you. And so then I get a phone call, ring, ring, and it's Mr. or Miss Recruiter. Hey, what's going on? And they tell me all sorts of things. No, I love it here. But I, I really haven't talked to them in a while, so there's no connection. I know them. I haven't seen them in a while, but there's no connection. And all of a sudden they go, well, you know, hey, no problem. Why don't you let us fly out for a little bit? Fly out to meet us. And all of a sudden they start filling in the gap. And the narrative gap starts being filled by someone else. And you wonder why people are leaving nonstop. And so the thing I've been telling leaders is, and, and, and I'm going to warn you before I say this, if your mind goes immediately to social media, you're not listening. Because everyone's mind immediately says, well, i got to get on social media. Social media is a piece of the solution, but it's not the only part. What leaders need to do is leverage current modern technology to start filling the narrative gap. So I don't know if you know who Brian Covey is. Lone Depot. Yeah, I know the name. Okay. I know the name. Most people know the name. Yep. Okay. So Alec Hansen. Another Nolan Depot guy. Yeah. Right? He's got the uh, another big podcast. So I was talking to Brian about this, and he 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 signed up for Amplify two years ago, prior right prior to the pandemic, and then they they weren't allowed to travel. Mm -hmm. Right. There's big so that stopped. Two years later, he showed up here in, in Fort Lauderdale, and it was probably about two months ago, three months ago, and hit it off first time we met. But then we went to dinner that night, and I kept saying, "I'm like, man, it's so good to see you again." He's like, "Renee, what do you mean again?" I'm like. Yeah, I can. I'm like, this is not our first time. He goes, wait, is it our first time? I'm like, we spent 45 minutes trying to figure out, going through our calendars, if we had ever met. And dude, it was our first time meeting in person. And that was a, the thing for me. It was, that's the solution. And it's what we've tried to create. He leverages all channels of communication, blogs, all social media channels, video, phone calls, texts every form of communication to put himself out there talking about who he is top to bottom so when you meet him you feel like you already know him yeah and to the point where it's just like what and so we were at amcon and alec anson i brought him on stage to talk about uh linkedin and the guy's a master of linkedin i mean he's just smart he's great on stage he's just a charismatic, no ego. Like, it's one of the things I told him. I said, you know what I love about you? Dude, you run an $8 billion region and there's no ego to you. Like, it's just, it's just an awesome energy to work with, right? And we're going up there and I was like, you know, and, and we're talking about the narrative gap and he goes, yeah, I mean, and Renee and I was first time. I'm like, I looked at him on stage. I'm like, what? And I'm just, I had this moment on stage. I'm like, again, it happened. I'm like, this is our first time? I'm like, dude, I swear to God, we've met three times. <laughs> And he's like, no, dude, this is our first time. We finally got a chance to meet Renee. And I'm like, and I like literally had this mind-blowing experience because he also does the same thing. What you're doing with this podcast, guess what? Is filling the narrative gap. People, when they get a chance, if you listen to your podcast, people meet you. How many times have you heard? I'm going to guess that people say, dude, I feel like I know you already because I listen oh, yes. to your podcast. Yes. Right? Uh, you know what I, what I get is 
you sound just like you do on the podcast. Yeah. I'm like, yep, because it's really me. That's, well, that's it's, also great audio, it, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you had JC's in the background. I was like, yep, I got that. Like, I got that. That's all me, man. Um, but that's for leaders. But are you saying that you go around the country and you're writing books where you're teaching startup businesses and young entrepreneurs and beginning salespeople how they too can fill the narrative gap? Every, well, I think anybody who influences anybody is a leader. Okay. Right? I, so I, if in Parents so, are leaders. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Teachers are leaders. Absolutely. Upperclassmen. Absolutely. Are, are leaders. Older brothers and sisters okay. are leaders. And so when you think about that and you say, okay, if this is the world that I'm in and technology is, is enticing me to willingly move away and to expand my reach willingly, then I got to understand that also that creates a consoling illusion, to keywords, consoling illusion, that I actually have connections when I don't. So if those two things are true, then how do I leverage all of the channels to be able to actually start filling in and telling the world who I am and what I believe? And it's not filling the channels with advertisements. It's yes, do please it. do not vomit on me. No, it's about... Nate Morris did that once on a bachelor party. It's not a good thing. <laughs> it is not a good thing to no, have anyone ever vomit on no, you, we don't whether it's liter literally or figuratively. Yeah. Yeah. And so we think about that and say, you know, how do you fill the narrative gap on in your industry? Because right now, uh, unfortunately, the mortgage industry is not viewed well. And uh, here's, how, here's how I know this. I did a keynote a couple years ago, and we were in Lake Tahoe. And they had hired the, uh, a Comedy Central comedian to be the opener. And I'm going, and I looked around the room. This is a very old mortgage company. They've been around a long time, like since the 1800s. And I looked around, I'm like, okay, I know this comic. He's about to stir some shit. Yeah. Right. And he starts off. He's like, "Hey, it's great to be here. And it's awesome." And he goes, "He goes, hey, real quick, how many people have been here? Five years." Raise his hands. He goes, oh, ten years." He goes, "Anybody, fifteen years?" He goes, oh, "I thought I recognized you guys from the Big Short." Yeah. And they <laughs> did not laugh. They didn't. No. That's funny. I think it's hilarious. That's funny. Yeah. I that's was... a great book, by the way. People are looking for book recommendations. When you're done reading Renee's book, that's out that you can purchase right now. Amplify your influence. Your influence. I always want to say my influence because I want to amplify my influence, but it's about amplifying their influence. So amplify your influence. The Big Short's another great book. But okay, so so he tells the joke, it bombs. Well, nobody nobody laughs. Yeah. I'm dying. I'm like hunched over, just dying. But that was amazing. But what it indicates, see, the reason why comics are good is they crack underlying tension and underlying social truths, and that's what memes do. Memes that you read a meme and you're like, oh my god, that's so funny because it's an underlying social truth that's been unspoken. And a meme is the one that speaks it and go, they go, yeah. oh, it pops that tension. And a comic can realize and see what are the underlying underlying tensions. And if an industry has an underlying tension of mistrust and that becomes humorous, you got to listen to that. And you say, okay, so there's a narrative out there. So let me let me cover narrative. So yeah. what, what do I mean by narrative? So I had a client that, that, that asked me that because he had just canceled an event three days prior to the event. And he's a really good friend, so I can mess with him. And... He's a great leader too. And he calls, he's like, dude, our whole office got COVID. He goes, I can't imagine us wearing masks in this event. And I'm like, oh, no, you probably can't do that. And it's, you know, we want to see facial expressions and everything. And he's like, dude, I can't do it. I got to cancel. I'm like, okay, just so you know, I go, I don't sell a product. I got 365 days a year I can sell. And if I can't fill it, I only got 364. So I'm out 30,000 bucks. He goes, dude, you're making me feel bad. I go, I know. I'm saying that so you buy some books. And so, <laughs> and so we laughed and we were talking about narrative. He goes, what do you mean by narrative? I said, okay, here's an example. We get off this phone call. Somebody asks me, how'd the call go? I'm going to give you two answers. And one answer is somebody, hey, how'd the call go? I'm like, this guy, I can't believe how selfish some people are. Like literally, we, he cancels the event three days prior, knows I can't even fill it. I mean, I'm out 30 grand. I mean, seriously, I can't even believe how people can be so selfish sometimes. He's like, dude. I'm like, no, no, no. I go, there's answer one. I go, or I could say this. Hey, how'd the call go? I'm like, you know what? I seriously have the best clients. This poor guy gets COVID in his entire office and has a shut, has a shut, cancel the event three days prior. He's probably going to get nailed for hotel fees and who knows what else, probably airline fees. And he didn't even ask for his money back. He's allowing us to reschedule. I mean, how cool is that? Same event, two different narratives. Both construct, if you were to hear one, will construct your reality of whether he's a good person or a bad. And so the power of that frame or the narrative that we place around an event, a product, a service, a profession, a relationship is the most powerful thing. That's what Amplify is about is understanding that moment 
the power of that, and then the sequence of which and how it works in conversation. And so most people don't claim the narrative or claim the frame. They assume it, which is the biggest mistake. Mm-hmm. And so we flip that all upside down in the process. That's fantastic. So you, you do this once a year as AmpCon. AmpCon's once a year. It's once a year. And it's basically my words, not yours. It's a crash course. It's a eight, it's an eight-hour event, one-day event. You're probably on the stage for four or five, and you bring in some of your friends to speak for the other it's three the, or three or four. Actually, AmpCon is different. Okay. AmpCon is theme-based, thematic. It's a one-day clear experience with a story arc, right? And so it's it's not me. On, I'm actually on stage 100% of the time. Okay. And so if people do come on stage, they're on stage with me to serve one specific purpose within the story arc of the theme. of. So this year's theme was the leadership narrative. Okay. Right? How do I control the narrative of what's going on? There's so much change in the industry right now. Interest rates going up. I'll give you an example. One, what, you know, there's this narrative. You know, hey, I understand interest rates going up right now. I know it's a tough time right now. I know there's a lot of stress going on. Right? That's one leadership way of doing it. But the real leaders saying, hey, guys, the best thing that's happening right now is interest rates are going up. This is the best thing that happened to all of you because right now the people that shouldn't be in this industry are going to get out. And I go, look at all the pros. I'm going to ask the pros right now, how many pros in the room are excited that the interest rates are going up? I said, look at them. These are the producers. And if you're not excited and the producers are, that means we got something to learn, opportunities in the air. I said, so I want you all to smile. Every time it goes up, I want you to get happy. I go, so now that's leadership, controlling the narrative. And when you control the narrative, you control focus, where the 40 volts go. And you control the focus, and what we focus on is what actually becomes reality, and what I see becomes what I interpret. And so now, how I see the world is based on the narrative and the frame that I choose. That's where we get into the deep. And so now you think about, there's a world that's happening, but I control the reality of that world based on how I choose to see it. But I'm showing people the science of it, and I'm showing you how to communicate on it, and how to shift it in others. Would you ever, or are you thinking about doing that twice a year and not once a year? Well, like we, Stephen Marshall used to before COVID, he would do his event usually twice a year, once in Vegas, once in, in Atlantic City. We're, we're being asked to. You're being asked to. Yeah, because the... I'm it, sure the tea loppers would love to be a part of it now that they're, they're learning all about we it. We would love to have the tea loppers yeah. there. We'd love to have you there, too. Yeah. The, I'd love to be there. To, we have to do this there. Oh, that would be awesome. Wouldn't yeah. that be fun? Hey, JC always says put it out in the universe. Okay, so that's AmpCon. Yep. Amplify, which, how many did you do last year? 33. Baller! Yeah. So you did 33 of those events. How many are you going to do this year? Probably, I know it's taxing. It's a lot yeah. of travel for you. It's Well, it's a lot. I mean, you, you, they're three-day events. Um, they're, three, you know, they're three days. We tried to do two two to three. Sometimes I did four, five a month. Um, and But is that a pace you could, you could keep up with, like realistically? For a few years. I mean, I've been okay. doing this for a long time. And so it's, it's right now because... We're building a momentum, and so right now this course is really and, and, it, and it just keeps evolving. Mm-hmm. In well, like anything you do, I'm sure you get better the more you do it. Yeah, you get better ideas with audience feedback, mm-hmm. um, and you can make your tweaks and adjustments as we all follow James Clear's advice to get one percent better per day. Absolutely. Okay. And, and we're but we're what I'm looking at this right now is saying, okay, how do I bring this to more people? Is the thing, and and if you go through it, that's the thing that people say. How do we get this in the hands of more people? That's what's really cool about it because. It's not just about helping people's business. People are understanding who they are. Mm-hmm. And so I'll even give you one more thing. Why influence? So I understand life through its opposite. That's, I'm a, it's from a philosopher at heart. And so when I look at something to understand it, I say, okay, let me look at the opposite of it. If I really want to understand it, i got to understand its opposite. So I know light because I know what dark is. I know what a good microphone is because I know what a bad one sounds like. <laughs> so I know that's why I love this. Yeah. Right? And so you know, I know life through contrast. And so what's the opposite of influence? You tell a joke, no one laughs. You sell a product, no one buys. You cast a vision, no one follows. How are you feeling? Oh, well, terrible. Terrible. Times three. Struck keep, out. Keep going. What else are you feeling? What are you actually feeling? Horrible, depressed, yeah. not worthy. Yes, keep going. Uh, failure. Yes. What um, does that translate into after a while? Depression, negativity, oh, self-doubt. It is a spiral. I would venture to say it is probably the worst of human experiences, that you don't have an impact on the world that I feel insignificant. The lack of influence equals insignificance. And so then I go, okay, so what does influence mean? I tell a joke, people laugh. I sell a product, people buy. I cast a vision and whoa, they follow. I set an event for Amcon and they show up. 
Yeah. Which is still what I get emotional about. I'm like, they showed up. And that feeling is a feeling of, oh my gosh, I'm, I, I can impact the world. I have an idea and things move. I move this hat and it moves. I say something and you, you, you're affected by it. So influence is about creating significance. And significance is created through having an impact. And an impact specifically on the world around me. Let me define the world around me. Right now the world around me is you and JC. And if anybody's listening, but they're not around me at the moment. I'm hoping if you're listening to this, there's an impact. But I won't know that unless I get a message back or anything. And that's, that's the whole purpose of lighthouses. The lighthouse philosophy is I, I'm going to shine no matter what. And I don't need the feedback. Because I think how many, how many times has ships said, there's a lighthouse. Thank God they yeah. were shining and I got to keep going. But whew. And they never get the thank you. right? So there's that side of it. But my impact on the world is the knowledge that I see what's happening. And so part of, there's a leadership lesson in there. How do you feedback? Hey, look at what you did here. And show the end result. I know that you feel like you're just doing these little things, but let me show you what, what this impacted into a loan processor. Look at the people that you put in the house, right? In the, the LP1s and the, you know, the whatever you na name, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you show them? Look at the impact that you've had. And all of a sudden, they're now doing things a little bit more deliberately. They're doing things a little bit more intentional because they know the impact of that, what's going on. That makes me feel good because I end one particular email that I send on a monthly basis. And every single month, the last paragraph, I remind the entire staff this email goes out to 120 people. And I say, you are single-handedly creating wealth and then many times generational wealth through your hard work and your dedication. And it goes unnoticed, but please know it doesn't go unnoticed with me, and we appreciate you for it. Yeah. Um, awesome. You sharing that, I was like, oh, wow, I'm doing something good. Yeah. I did it because it came from my heart. I yeah. did it because I believe in it. That um, makes you a good leader. If When I come, I was supposed to be at this AmpCon, mm -hmm. at this Amplify. Right. And then work and life got in the way. And quite honestly, I, I remember talking to you about it. I'm like, hey, Renee, I kind of got to bolt out on Saturday because I have a, a date with my wife. Like, it's a concert, Garth yeah, yeah. Brooks. I can't pass it up. She'd be, she'll divorce me. You can't. Um, and, and we're going out of town for my company's like big achievers club the next day. Don't want to spend that many nights away from the kids, blah, blah, blah. What am I missing out? And when I do go, because I'm going to go on, is it still see Renee speak? Uh, or meet Renee. Meet Renee. Yep. M E E T R E N E. Yep. Dot com meet Renee. So I'm going to go, I'm going to look at the dates. I'm going to find a date that works for me and I'm going to sign up because I want to do this. I've wanted to do it for two years, but I'm finally like we had Molly and Adu on. She's a hundred million dollar producer. You and Molly are friends, mm -hmm. been friends for years. You live in the same city. And I asked Molly about it and she was like, mind blown, mind blown. I said, would you do it again? Cause it's not cheap. And she's like, Oh, all day, like all day. She'd do it again. What am I missing this weekend by not sticking out? But what am I going to get if I go to Philly or I go to Lake Tahoe or I go to Vegas to, to see it? What what am I? Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't be too too long. But sure. like, what, what what am I getting from Amplify? So we had one person go twelve times last year. I've had uh, you know Who? The, uh, anyone I know. Oh, Eric Mitchell. Okay, yeah. But yep. he he brings a story to each one, so he's developing a specific strategy. Okay. He's got, I got you for three days, Renee. This is what I'm developing, and we just hone in on one okay. story. And but I've had you know Tony Blodge has been five times, um, you know Dan Kelly's been four, um, so we've got the people very big producers go through because they realize the first time is one, the second time, but basically what it is, Am Amplify, is a three day experience that's designed to help you understand the science of influence and then apply it. So it's not it's not saying here's how it works. I'm going to say here's how it works, but we're going to do it for three days, and we're going to uncover your story. And you're going to learn how to tell it. And not just understand your story, but I'm going to teach you the body language. We're going to learn the voice inflections. You're going to learn all of the essence to create what we call congruency. That's the hard part, hardest part. When people talk about, like, Renee's very intense. I'm very intense in the course. And the reason is you're spending 6000 bucks. Yeah. Like, I'm And like, by the way, it's an intimate setting. What is it, like 8 to 12 people max? 12 max. 12 yeah. max. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you're, the, the, the reason I go with an intensity is that I believe that if you're going to work, why not give it 100%? And most people don't know what 100% means. They think their 100% is actually 40%. And so we teach them what 100% really feels like. And you know, as an athlete, 
the dark side of, of mm-hmm. working out. Yeah. Where you think you're done, and then something happens, and you find something else. Yeah, and crank out four more sets. Yeah, and, yeah. You, and then you think you're done again, and then something happens, and somebody looks at you, and you're like, you, you got more inside. There's more in all of us. And so we take an intense approach to it. And so give you an example. Night one, which is tomorrow night. We spent about three, four weeks finding a chef. And the first night, people think it's dinner. It's not dinner. It's the actual workshop. And it's an eight to ten course tasting menu. So once we get past the the, the catering manager and everybody, we need the chef. He's like, no, the chef's busy. I know the chef's busy. You want reservations? I need a lot more than reservations. I'm credit credit experience. Blah, blah, blah. We finally get to them. And I say, chef, before we get started, I have one question for you. I go, not even a question. I want to tell you the vision of what we're trying to do. And I want to see if you agree. I said, we believe that a piece of chicken with no story ends up on a dollar menu at KFC. But a piece of chicken with a story and in the hands of a pro like you, an artist, we'd pay $150 to eat it off a tasting menu. Do you agree? And I watch the response. If I get the first thing where he looks at his watch and he's like, well, how, how long and how many people? I mean, we got to kind of keep it you know, mm-hmm. less than two hours. I already know it's the wrong chef. But if I see that chef light up, his, I see the whites of his eyes, and he just goes and he looks at me and he goes, you know what? You get it. That's why we do what we do. I, I, I have ideas. I've been planning something like this. This is like... This is my, what, what I really want. Like, that's my chef. And so we designed an 8 to 10 course tasting menu. And I, he goes, do you want to know what's in it? I go, no, I don't want to know. I want to know one thing. Do you love it? And I want you to cook from your childhood. I want you to have a story for each of these. I want it to be off menu. And I want you just to let your heart cook that night. And I don't care if they like it. You can be creative. We've had snails. We've had five-year-old eggs. We've had all <laughs> sorts of crazy stuff. Normal, but normally it's it, it is literally, and they come out and they they're trembling when I get to the first night. Yes, Mr. Rodriguez, I'm like, I'm like, hey, call me Renee, and I'm like, like Renee, we're the whole staff is excited for tonight. That's cool. And you get a whole restaurant cool. behind it, and then the the people get there like, what's going on tonight? I'm like, I go, tonight's not about food. I want you to watch everything that happens tonight, and they're in my job. I hit a pause button. Sometimes this dinner goes on for six hours. And every time they're watching how the food's delivered, and they're watching this food, and we have ground rules the whole night. One of them is they're not allowed to touch the food until the chef has fully explained it. And I go, and you're going to watch how the food, when it shows up, because light travels faster than sound, shows up, and you're looking at it, and you're going to have all sorts of assumptions is what it is. Those are your frames and narratives you're going to put around that. You might not like mushrooms. You see mushrooms, you're already going to say, I hate the dish. And then we had some guy, there's 12 mushrooms on there, and he's like, oh, my God. He goes, I gag when I think of mushrooms. Then the chef comes out and he goes, well, let me tell you about these mushrooms. These mushrooms were picked yesterday, and they only grow under catastrophe. And there was a lightning storm last night, and a tree was struck by lightning, and we knew that this was a chance that hopefully these mushrooms grew. So we walked out last night, me and my girlfriend, and we walked out and we found these. And so these are very hard to find. And the guy goes, catastrophe what? Yeah, I'm in. I'm in, yeah. right? Like, and he goes, that's like, the frame so, with the narrative. Exactly. Yes. And now all of a sudden, he eats it, and and then and then we have this conversation. Imagine ten courses like this mm-hmm. all night long, and then people are just kind of like, and there's another ground rule, no side conversation, so people are silent. They have to have a group conversation, so they're learning how to use their voice. And I go, so what does this little experience mean to your business? He's like, I I hated mushrooms, and he goes, I have a whole sales force that looks at mushrooms, looks at call, phone calls the way I look at mushrooms. And when he explained to me what it was, I got excited. I may not love it, but I didn't hate it. And I was excited to eat it. I need to be a better manager and leader and be able to help people get excited about phone calls. So and that's like, night, one. night one. Then you get into the day day one, day two. Which is which would be Friday. Saturday. Saturday. And by Saturday, that's that's the big reveal. That's when the life changing moments happen and you have that person who just thirty six hours was mumbling and bumbling, maybe speaking too high, speaking too low, too many clutch words, didn't have tie downs, didn't have takeaways, didn't know their signature story, which by the way, Mm -hmm. this audience knows about tie downs, Mm -hmm. they know about takeaways, and everyone has heard me talk about you need a signature story. Mm -hmm. This guy right here is where I learned it from 14 years ago, right? So how cool is that? And I can only imagine what it's like to go to Amplify where... I learned it over you know the course of probably an hour you know lesson here. You and I one on one one night in Palm Springs, <coughs> two friends just talking. Yeah, I couldn't imagine the intimate, deep dive that starts with a dinner that you now call Amplify. 
well, what's happening is the thing that, where it's grown to too. It's it's wild because so the next two days are started. We sit in a U shape, and people we they're in front the entire time. There's no PowerPoint for for three days, so the audience is my PowerPoint, and so they start off and. We start with this concept that light travels faster than sound. And so I said, in front of the room, who are you? What do you do? What makes you unique? And immediately I see where they put their hands, how they stand, where their weight shifts are, uh, all the things. And we start fixing and understanding that we're communicating things. And think about this. People say, why body language? Because if you want to understand how someone's feeling you know, and you want to read someone's mind, you got to read someone's body because the body is giving away how someone's feeling up to five seconds before your conscious awareness is even aware of how you're feeling. Up to five seconds, your body is telling people wow, what's going on before yeah. you're even aware of it. And so working with FBI trainers, the CIA, working with Navy SEALs, working with people that are in the business of having to really read those things, you can look at um, uh, signs of aggression prior to a fight. You can look at lies and signs of how people were, you, were, you know, signs of interest is where the belly button's pointed. You know, if I'm, mm. if, if I'm a couple, if we're a couple and I'm sitting like this, you know, and my navel is pointed away from you, that's a first sign that there's an issue here. But if there's a if the navel is in your direction, it's always a good sign. If someone's lying, you look at where their feet are pointed. The feet are always pointed towards the door. If someone's comfortable in the room, the spread between their legs, if they're super close in, they're, they're trying to take up less space, they're not comfortable, don't sell that person at that point. They don't feel safe, right? Do something else to sort of break the ice and make them feel comfortable. You start watching their, their feet sort of take a little bit further distance apart, you know, and how they, where their arms are. You know, there's so many things that do that. and then. What we're trying to do, the hard part is what we call congruency. That your voice and your mind want to say one thing, but your body sometimes says the opposite. And my job is, is to merge those two into a congruent same lane. And that process can feel brutal. It can, because it forces you to look at behavior that you didn't know you had, quirks that you maybe didn't realize, maybe even habits. Some people have a permanent frown resting bitch face. Yeah. And I tell them, I'm like, you, by the way, I'm just going to tell you right from the start, you have an RBF. And so if you don't smile, that's how people are going to perceive you. You don't have to. But, and I take a picture and I say, this is what people see. And I say, what's your goal? Is your goal to be approachable or to, to people be scared to talk to you? Approachable. I said something, you need to smile. So they get that level of feedback right away. That's the intensity of which we approach it. But that's why people opt into it. I said, did you come in here to be the same or did you come in here to grow? And I share my own stories too. I'm not somebody, you know, I'll cry along with them if we need to cry. Yeah. But it is it is a group journey that we do where people come in, they learn their story, they learn how to tell it, and they're doing that for three days. Yeah, one of my favorite quotes or phrases or isms that I live by, nothing changes if nothing it changes. changes. You know, it's, it's, it's so true. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to buy the book probably because we're friends and you are so generous to, to sit down for an hour with us and do this. I'm going to buy multiple books because I'm going to use them as giveaways. I'm going to use them as centerpieces. But when I read the book without ruining it for me, what am I going to learn in the book? When I buy Amplify Your Influence. So I put my heart and soul in that book. It is a step-by-step -step guide through the course. And we had to look at it and say, okay, am I trying to replicate the course or am I trying to? I, I wanted that to be a manual that walked people through, even if they never took the course, for $28, they could go through and they could implement every single process in it. And some people, I've, I've sent it to a few people, and literally they're looking at it. Um, I mean, we've got Horian Gracie, founder of the UFC, who's endorsed the book. He's on the back of it. And you know, he says, Renee's a black belt in, in uh, influence communication. It was kind of fun to hear him say that. His two kids are coming, by the Did way. Did you ask him to put you in like a, a, like a triangle or an arm bar? No, 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 that's too scary. I think I would have to. I think, yeah. I mean, if, if I'm around someone like that, I'm like, hey, bro, you mind just put me in a quick arm bar? Like, don't break my arm, but it'd just be cool. He'll totally do it. Yeah. He, he was at Amcon, too, by the way. Yeah, I saw that. But uh, his two kids, Horan and, uh, and uh, um, Horan and, uh, oh, man, what's that other one? No, no, his two kids. No, Hoist is his younger brother. But his two kids, they call me Uncle Renee, by the way. They're awesome. But they're coming to Amplify in Minneapolis. Too many rabbit holes, but how'd you meet them? Uh, like so years and years ago or just recently? I was at an event that, okay. that uh, Hiron, his son, was speaking at, or was, he was speaking at, and then um, just met him, just the most humble, zen-like, awesome. I'm a big fan of Gracie's. Yeah. They've been since before the UFC. Do you practice? I did for a long you time. You did? Okay. Yeah. And I was a huge fan. Purple, brown, how far did you get? Oh, uh, no. I, no. <laughs> I, <laughs> Maybe I, white with a black tip? Well, no, I mean, I, I've choked out purple belts. And, okay. Yeah, I've choked out. 
I've done that. No, she was six. Blue Renee. Belts she blue. was six. I've choked out blue belts. <laughs> a purple belt's a whole nother world. Yeah. And yeah, I've, uh, and mine was, I learned with no gi. It yeah. was for a long time is what I did. And I did it with some, some other, some other folks. So it was, it, I didn't follow that process. So, so but, the book, which I, I love hearing the, the book is amplify, but the way that I thought about it when you're sitting there talking, I go, oh, cool. The book is me buying the CD for back in the day when you bought CDs. Mm-hmm. Amplifies me going to the concert. Right? I love Eric Church. I love... Amp Con would be the going to the concert. Okay. Amplify would be like, um, let's uh, bring the concert to your living room with your uh, family. With your it family. would be like one of the most magical musical moments I've been a part of yeah. is anything at the Bluebird Cafe yeah. in Nashville. Yeah. But like 12 people though. Well, yeah. Well, and, and, and that was only like 30 people. Oh, so, th- there you go. Yeah, and there it was... Go. That's exactly it. Yeah. yeah. And you know, especially Nashville, too. Like, yeah, especially in Nashville. Okay, but I like that. Yeah. Okay, it's it's bringing, yeah. it's me bringing Eric Church into my living room with eight of my closest friends. You know, I had to apply uh, an audition for the audiobook. <laughs> Let's talk about that at dinner. That's comical. Because, yeah. yeah. by the way, you have a great voice. I mean, you know that. I, I do have a question for you, for anyone who's tuned in this long and they have weird thoughts like I do. Was that a practiced voice or is that your natural? Like when you were 16 and 17, were you always that calm and reserved and like oh. the baritone is, is probably God gifted. Well, but no, there's two, there's two parts to that. Okay. I, I still need to answer your question about Horian, yeah. but, um, the voice is definitely practiced that there is a deliberate okay. nature to pauses and an, uh, and an understanding of when to think. So that's definitely practiced. But like you stay behind the pendulum, like to use a Sandler sales training tactic. I suck at staying behind the pendulum. Hmm. I would like to mirror more of what you do or like I'm a big fan of Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Yeah. And I would like to be able to mirror some of some of those tactics where I can use that, what does he call it, the late night DJ mm-hmm. soft rock uh, voice. So I used to literally stretch my vocal cords where you you'd lean your voice as far back as you can and then you go and then you go further and then you'd close your mouth and that would stretch it out and you just do exercises like that. And so I would do all of that, but then you learn how to speak in your diaphragm. So I, I speak sometimes 12, 15 days straight mm-hmm. all day. I've never had a voice issue because I never use my throat. Okay. It's always down here. Like so <clears throat> So if I'm using my throat, this is what it sounds like here. So I'm not resonating anything further. So if I were to talk loudly from here, it would put a lot of pressure on my, on my, my uh, vocal cords. <clears throat> but if I'm if I'm, I'm here, so now right now if I'm if I'm on a podcast, welcome to the podcast. And so here, this is something that resonates very deeply, and it's it's coming from a deeper place. It just it's practice. Everybody can do it. You can t- pretend to have a deep voice once. Oh, hello, I have a deep voice. My name is Dustin. Yeah, so if you... So you I also sound like a, a DJ at a strip club, but... I mean, <laughs> yeah, i my, my jokes my, there. My, my whole thing is sometimes I'm like a chimpanzee smoking crack, <laughs> and I need to, like, dial that back a little bit. Well, that's part of your energy, though, too. Yeah. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got a very high level of energy, too. And so, to me, the, the more I do this, the more I was telling someone... I forget who was telling this. I said, they're saying, well, do you have your content ready? I'm like... <laughs> yes. Yeah. And I said it and it, well, where is it? I go, I go, it's not about the content anymore. It's about me listening right now. They go, what do you mean? I go, the content is ready. It's been ready. I can do it's anything. It's 27 I want. years in the making. It's here. And I go, and I, if it's a PowerPoint, I don't even use PowerPoint anymore. I go, just need that easel pad. I hate PowerPoint. Can't stand it. I may have stole that from you. When I speak, I want two whiteboards. There you go. You put me in front of a whiteboard, let me go crazy. Yeah, because you can, and you know, the audience loves it because you're creating for them in real time. It's a, it's a natural, you're, they're watching you create an idea, and that's the novelty, by the way. Remember we talked about, not, the norepinephrine was the tension. Mm-hmm. When you use a whiteboard, they're watching the creation of an idea. Even if it's bad handwriting, I'm watching it. That's novel. Something changes from here to there. That's why we use our hands in, in Zoom. It creates novelty. And so the novelty and tension create attention. Dopamine, norepinephrine, create attention. So, but yeah, so the, to me, those two elements of being able to use your voice that way is what there. So yeah, so I had to... Will, will, will we work on that at Amplify? If that's something you want to, because I try to help people move down to a little deeper place, but okay. sometimes you don't need need to. I mean, I don't think your voice is bad. All right. Yeah. I mean, if it's, it's, it's one of those that you learn to sort of pull from a little deeper place, and that's more of a projection too. It's like you can learn to project a voice 
to have a more command of a room. You, you'll feel it resonate a little bit better, different, and that's that's in posture. How do you let the wind come out of your chest and all of that stuff? Because if you're hunched over, it's hard for it to really leave. You know, I haven't forgotten what a hoist's kids call you, Uncle Renee. <laughs> so so yeah. So I I was there. Um, I my son took a class with Hidon. Okay. And so they're at seven hundred, eight hundred dollars an hour for class, and he gave my son a free class. It was one of the coolest experiences. These guys are literally the best teachers in the world. Not only the assassins, but the way they teach, it is beautiful. I mean, there there are teachers and then there are just the masters. Mm-hmm. And watching him teach my son, it was just, it was poetry. And then we stayed to watch a class and we were there in Gracie University and, and I hear this voice. That Where is I, that? Uh, oh. It was in Torrance at the time. Okay. And I hear this voice and I'm like, no way. I hear him speaking Portuguese and I know that voice. And I look over, I'm like, that's Horian and Gracie, the founder of the UFC. And I'm like, I never get starstruck. And I meet celebrities all the time. I'm like, I'm starstruck. And I, wa- I had to walk over. I said, Alex, Diego, come with me. I said, this is the legend. This is the founder of the UFC. This is the oldest son of Elio Gracie, the, the creator of Brazilian uh, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. This is, this is the guy. And I, I, I said, Mr. Mr. Gracie, I said, it's an honor to meet you. He goes, Hello, how are you? And he's just like this most charismatic, and he's like, "What are you doing?" And within two minutes, he goes, "Have you seen our our uh, uh, Have you seen our museum?" I'm like, "No." He goes, "Well, I'd love to give you a tour." I'm no like, way! How cool is that? I'm like, "What?" And it's just me and my two kids. He gives us an hour and a half tour of the Gracie Museum, walking through every detail of how the family came and the story, and and I'm just like. And I, I'm like, I'm like, look, my kids, I'm like, you guys have no idea no. what's happening right now. And it was one of those things. I'm like, I just, I'm blown away. I end up buying swag. He, he gives me his cell phone number. We connect. We start doing other stuff. I start, I'm like, I'm doing these events. I'm like, you guys need to get Hori and I get him some gigs. We start becoming friends. He, he calls me to help negotiate some deals here and there. And we just became friends and um, came to Amcon. He brought his, his kid. I'm like, I'm like, he's coming with me. So I, I took his kid, introduced him to a bunch of people. And, That's so cool. Yeah. But his kids are just as charismatic, just as smart. The way they carry themselves. I mean, you can tell this family is here to change the world. It's pretty amazing. That's fantastic. Let's do this. Let's wrap it up. You and I can sit here for two more hours. I was going to say. Well, I'm getting hungry. <laughs> JC's getting thirsty, right? They don't sell Heineken at the bar down, downstairs, so he needs to get out and grab himself a couple drinks. Um, you and I can finish this conversation. Yeah. We will find a way to be in the same city again. Yes. Whether it's it's me having to come to Amcon to, to bring out the mics and the headsets. I want to do more of this. Yeah, man. This like, is fun. Like, I love you as a person, but I love you as a professional as well. Likewise, man. Um, People want to check you out. We've already said see, oh. no, meet Renee. You can go see Renee speak on Instagram. Okay, see Renee speak is okay. your IG handle. Yep. Okay, and Renee is R E M E. Yep. Meet Renee. Not M E A T. Not, <laughs> well, <laughs> My, that's you know, your alter ego. I mean, somebody actually bought that for me. They, like, I made that joke and somebody bought it and sent it to me. I'm like, that oh, that's really, so that cool. That was cool. Though. Yeah, it's a good, good spin of $35 on yeah. GoDaddy. Yeah. Uh, no, M E E T R E N E, meet yeah. Renee. So if you want to check out the amplified dates, which mm-hmm. is what I'm going to do literally tomorrow when I get back to the office, I need to figure out which dates work for me. Yep. Um, I tend to look for like travel schedules and cool cities you're going to be in mm-hmm. uh, is what I look for. Some people may prefer to say, I want to keep it in my hometown and maybe I can get to get a group of seven of my colleagues together, which I know is something that you always support and you promote. Yeah, we're, we're, we're really sold out right now. That's the, that's the challenge. After Amcon, we, we, we had 75 people sign up in, at 12. So it's like... Um, it, it sells I, out I fast. guess we're gonna look at 2023. No, no, or... no there's there's still dates. But okay, we just gotta we gotta move fast. Okay, you gotta move fast, and because we're friends of Renee, we want to see you on every bestseller list out there: Wall Street Journal, USA Today, New York Times. Thank you. So we want to get out there and buy your book. Yes. Do I buy it on Amazon? It's on Amazon right now. We're Perfect. On... Is that the best way to buy it? Well, if you're buying more than 20, then send me a message. Uh, actually, Jenny, J E N N Y at meetrene.com. Or Renee. Jenny, just email me. I'm buying 20. And uh, no, he's going to buy. He's going to buy a lot more than 20. We're going to we're going to get him. We're going to get him up there. Renee, I'm doing 75 hard. I don't think you're going to get me drunk tonight. But uh, <laughs> you know, I can't. I can get my arm twisted a little bit. You can throw me one of those rear naked chokes, and I'm sure. I'm sure I'll tap out. Oh, we'll, we'll we'll do a nice exchange. We'll we'll make it we'll make it we'll, a no brainer. We'll we'll figure it out. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Hey, look. 
He's Rene Rodriguez. I'm Dustin Owen. You have tuned in to the Lone Officer Podcast. That is all the time we have for you today, but we will catch you on the next episode.